Well, if, if, I'll tell you guys this right now. Okay. okay. <laughs> we did it. There we go. We did it. Timer, is it starting? Can you put it in the front? Because then I watch it and then I or just put it down a little lower. Are we ready? We're ready. How was the quiz, everybody? It was odd. It was good? Just How about that? Okay. How, uh, do you make spring break plans? Going to Portland. Going to Syria. Doing things that they probably shouldn't say in the last room. No, I think people are leaving Syria. I think that's what we're going to be talking about today, actually, because that's what might interest you. But I just wanted to give a quick update on our real ID bill. It did get the votes to get out of committee. So it has until next Wednesday to pass off the House floor. Governor Inslee this week has been on TV saying that it's very important to pass. And the Senate has been on TV this week saying it's very important to pass. And the House has been quiet about it. So um, next Wednesday at 5 p.m., if it doesn't get off the House floor, that's the normal schedule. And they'll have to do some procedural moves to get it incorporated if it doesn't make it by then. So it's up to the House whether they schedule to hear it on the floor or not. So that's our update. I know you're a little tired of talking about that bill. Just a little bit. Yeah, just a little bit. Okay, so um, your teacher and I were emailing, and I don't think we've talked about the fact that there are lobbyists at lots of different levels. There's lobbyists at the local level, like city level. There's lobbyists at the state level, which I am. There's lobbyists at the federal level, and there's actually international lobbyists. So international lobbyists work for different companies who have interests in different countries, and they bring the diplomats or the government leaders together of those countries and try and come up with common agreements. So it looks a little bit different. Those are lawyers, primarily, in international law. There's a law firm in Tacoma, actually, that has an international attorney that is a lobbyist that um, I have discussed uh, international lobbying with, and it sounds fascinating. It takes a lot longer though, as you can imagine, to come up with change. Um, but some examples are, um, you know, uh, if there are rape cases or those kinds of things and people cross borders, they've come up with in international agreements to make sure that those people are prosecuted or for other crimes as well. Um, or businesses if they want to operate in multiple different countries smoothing over regulations. So that's a little bit of what an international lobbyist does. I think you guys have been talking about some international politics, though, and how countries are or are not working together well, uh, especially with Syria. So can I hear some of the things you guys have been discussing in class or some of the wonderings that you have? Well, we dropped bombs on them. We did. We did. Um, we. We dropped 59 18 oh, foot um, warheads on them with a, with a thousand pounds of explosive in each one of them. Um, That's so America. <laughs> so they actually, they were launched from the sea. They were launched from ships and uh, they traveled in the air for 30 minutes before they hit their targets and then all of them exploded within a few minutes. Um, did you guys, have you paid attention to what they were targeting? It was um, missile manufacturing. It was, yes, it's exactly where the planes took off. So it's the landing strips and where the planes that drop the chemical weapons would take off from. And the thinking is that then it would prevent additional chemical warfare attacks on the Syrian people. Any estimation um, on how much each one of those 59 missiles cost? 15 million. 1.5. 1.5. 1.5. 1.5. 1.5. 1.5. 1.5. 1.5. 1.5. 1.5. 1.5. 1.5. 1.5. 1.5. 1.5. 1.5. 1.5.
1.6 million each. Somebody Googled it. That's awesome. Or guess. So, so that means if we, if we invested 59 of those, that means it's about $95 million. No, that's not counting anything with the ships or the people, but $95 million in missiles. Oh, we can't have to say we can't afford to be homeless, but. Yeah, $95 million goes a long way, doesn't it? In different uses. Where's that? Uh, you know what I could do with $95 million? There is. Michael, you're really hot. Almost Build my own nation. So each of those missiles costs $1.6 million. And to intercept each of those missiles, so in Israel, those missiles are launched at them all the time and they intercept them, they have a system, it costs half a million dollars each time they intercept them. So every time one gets launched at them, they have to spend a half a million dollars to make sure that it doesn't reach land. It's a pretty heavy investment for defense. So do you have any further questions about what our government's doing or what that government's doing or how it affects you? How many people died? Six. Yeah, six. They didn't get the memo, apparently, uh, because the, the U.S. did warn them that they were on the way, um, but they didn't get out of the way. So there's all the casualties. Wasn't the goal to, to take out the chemical weapons? Is that the, what was the goal? The goal was to take out the airfield, the, uh, the capability to launch more planes. Okay. And it was done in the middle of the night so that it would absolutely limit uh, human casualty. I'm not purporting it. I'm just saying that this is how their strategy. And once they were launched, remember it took 30 minutes for them to reach their target. Um, the players that could have been on the ground, Russia and others, were warned that they were coming in and to get out of the way. So something, the message didn't get to those six, obviously. The, the point was not human casualty, it was to disrupt infrastructure, which is, which is very similar to what we did in World War II. We destroyed bridges. That's what the U.S. did. We bombed bridges all over Europe so that Troops and supplies couldn't move from country to country. Sweet. Yeah. Nah, that's not interesting either. It's right. Hey, ask her a question. Does she think that we should still uh, pursue? Huh? I don't remember what the Socratic seminar was about. Oh, if the U.S. should respond to the refugees oh. or not. I don't think she <laughs> you're, gonna you're right there. I mean... Y'all I'm not doing it for you guys. <laughs> okay, do you think that the U.S. should respond to the refugees or no? Do I think that the U.S. did what? I'm sorry, there was a lot of noise. Do you think that they should, that the U.S. should aid and help the refugees of Syria or no? Uh, so the U.S. has a responsibility to promote peace in the Middle East. So if we are going to solely think about our own interests, if we're going to be completely selfish, primarily we need to assure that there is peace. Because when there's not peace, we only have one country that is a democracy in the Middle East, and that's Israel. And Syria and Israel share a border. And if there's no peace, then um, those Syrians that drop those chemical warfare on their own people, it's a shared border, could very well do it to Israel. Or those uh, missiles that were, you know, that, that they are preparing could go to Israel. If we have no base of democracy in the Middle East, then we have no way to protect um, what happens there. So I, I've been to Israel, 
And I've stood in Israel, and with my naked eye, I've seen Syria blow up. So I was there uh, September a year ago, so 19 months ago. And I could stand in the Golan Heights and watch buildings explode in Syria. That's and I could see the UN uh, military, and I could see the Israeli military um, just parked down there on the border. I could see the ambulances that were backed up to the border. And if any Syrians were injured or could make it to the ambulances, and the ambulances would take them to Israeli hospitals and treat them. But it's so close. It's really hard for us to conceptualize how close these countries are. So if there's one country that's in a civil war between tribes and they're willing to use chemical warfare on each other, this is not the first time, and bomb each other within the same country, and those people are flooding out to um, any, you know, they're escaping out of the country, it is a national, it's an international problem. It's more of a European problem because those Syrians are being resettled in Europe and the European economy is weak. There's high unemployment. They don't have a lot of money. And so they're taking in more people who literally have nothing, of course, um, and trying to teach them the language, trying to get them a job and training so that they can have housing. So it's a big international impact. <coughs> From a world perspective, absolutely, it's, it's terrible. Um, uh, from a regional perspective, Europe really should be very concerned, and that's partially why the European Union is breaking up, which is government relations and diplomacy. They have the European Union where all the Europe countries are together, almost like one government, almost like a United States where each of the states would be one of those countries. So the European Union is breaking apart. Uh, Britain voted to be not a part of it. Norway never joined it. And um, they've been picking on Greece because it has a terrible economy and thinking about kicking it out. So if they can't stand strong together, um, then it's going to mean that the Syrian refugees are not distributed among the nations in a way that could be integrated and that the, the burden will fall on just a couple countries. So what do you guys think? Should we be, should we be taking in more Syrian refugees? No. Yeah. Yes. No. I don't trust no. the no. So I, I want to hear a yes and I want to hear a no. So who wants to say yes? But explain more than the yes, yeah. right? So just Yeah. Are you want to explain why? Yes. yes. Explain why I, I no, no, I want to know why, yes, why should we be taking more? I think that it would be beneficial also, seeing as though we are helping aid them as well, and we could create somewhat of a type of peace or agreement with the Syrian people in general. And that's actually the greatest hope. The greatest outcome would be that there would be stability in Syria and that the Syrians could go back to their own country. However, it's like gang warfare. There are these tribes that are um, big families, essentially, and they're fighting against each other for power, and different countries are giving different tribes money, arms, merchant marines, you know, warriors, and, and other things so that each of them are artificially strong and the battle continues. So Russia, Russia picked this tribe that's currently ruling. Um, Russia has an interest in the port that is in Syria and always having access to that port because it's for economic development and trade. And, um, but if that tribe is not stable enough to withhold from chemical warfare, for example, then that's still a dangerous situation. Obviously, we wouldn't send the Syrians, after there was a government in place, back to Syria there. So Canada has a much different approach. They're accepting a lot more Syrians than the United States is. So um, that was a yes. Where's a no? Where's an ex explanation for the no? Yes. 
No, um, like you said already, it's more of a European problem. I feel like we should just leave it to their own battles. And also, like you said, you said it's like gang warfare. Um, I don't see how we're going to put money into a gang warfare environment when we can't even get our gangs in order with the blood scripts and what else and the crap on the streets. So I feel like we should be putting more money over here and what we need more than what they need because what they need is basically what we need, but just in the Middle East. So the only thing that we would lose if we just let them do whatever they want to do is potentially risk for a nuclear attack in the future because those, those countries, those tribes don't love us. I mean, let's get serious. They can have terrorist type attacks on our soil. But the greatest thing that we would lose is Israel. So the question is, do we care about protecting Israel in the Middle East? Is that important to us or not? And politicians are divided. Some um, believe strongly that it's absolutely important to our security to have Israel. And some are more like we should just be taking care of things within our borders. And that's far, far away. Well, I feel like um, with the with the Israel situation, it's just like in the Bible, the end times where Israel and was it Jordan? They they fight each other with the Muslims and the Christians, and I feel like that's their war. Like we have lots of allies, just not Israel, but also it's like um, like you said, there's lots of terrorists. So if there's terrorists and they don't like us already, why put our nose in their business? And to make them more mad, yeah. Exactly. And to actually have that nuclear threat go from 50 or say 80% to 99%. Mm -hmm. So how many people then in the classroom, show of hands, believe that taking care of our domestic issues, domestic <coughs> violence, domestic security is more important than the Middle East? So is there anything agree with what Sharon said? So, One, two. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Looks like twelve of what do we have? Twenty-three. Okay, so how many people believe it is as important? They should be equally important. Peace in the Middle East and our domestic safety and economy. Three, four, five, five or six. Okay, and how many believe that we should solely be focusing on making sure that we've solved? violence and crime and poverty and peace in the United States. Let the rest like of the world do its thing. That's the same number as the first one. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, but like some of the problems in the United States is because we were not smart with our money. We didn't make intelligent choices. We're already ignoring our own problems. Anyway. So why so are the money com comment is that because we're spending so much on international issues? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Like, well, yeah, that's like, one of the classmates yeah, yeah. were saying, but like, I don't understand how if we also help with other people's problem, problems, we're not going to have enough money or so to deal with our own problems. But seeing as though we trade with other countries and other like places, that's how we make money. And that's how we make allies. So I don't understand that at all. So, um, and money was the driver for our involvement in the Middle East. I see your hand in just a second. A Middle East in the first place because the Middle East has oil. Exactly. And so we were there to protect our interests and the fact that we would continue to have low cost oil mm -hmm. available for the United States. So if we want to decrease our dependency on the Middle East and maybe step away from our involvement there, we would have to make sure that we have sustainable energy within the United States, and that's the risk, and that's why historically we stepped into that space. Okay. But, but historically, we shouldn't, because like I already said, the Bible and the end times, Israel and Jordan was fighting that the United States and helping them out. If you want to look at it as a Bible view, not just a and there are there are also Christians that believe in the Bible view that Israel is extremely important um, for the the second coming of Christ. So that protecting Israel is a top priority of many conservative Christians, and they actually give the most amount of money 
for Israel. And so they see conflicts in the Middle East and potential enemies in the Middle East as stopping um, a, a safe Israel space, which is important for them in their scriptures. So there's there's both sides of the coin, obviously. So you had your hand up in front. Um, so first off, I think it's less of an economic issue, more about a humanitarian issue. Um, in the if in that no other person's life is worth less than mine. I wouldn't want to be in that situation, so I wouldn't want somebody else to be in that situation. And then point number two, when are we just going to pull Cuba 2.0 and just shoot Assad? Like, so do you think that we should just get rid of the root of the problem? Um, I, I'm kind of half and half on it because it's proven to work, and then in other cases it's proven to not work because when you take out one, another one just leaves in its place. So you need to take one and then build a fundamental stability inside of that country, which could be difficult if they have all these militant groups. But, I mean, it's not something that hasn't been done in the past. Uh, we were not that, that successful in Afghanistan. That was what we tried to do in Afghanistan. Yeah, so, but, I mean, you could take the chance or you could not take the chance and we could just keep doing what we're doing right now, which is obviously not working either. Right. So this is two reoccurring problems that were just mentioned then. One, you take out the big bully and another big bully steps up and then you're caught in this repeated cycle of taking out the big bully and then the next bully steps up. Or the second thing is, if all life, all human life is equal and we are responsible for all human life but we have limited resources, then it's like spreading peanut butter. I mean, it's just going to get thinner and thinner and thinner until no one has everything that they need. That is also a fear. When does it end? Do we protect our own, which means within our borders, or do we have a moral obligation to assure everyone in the world is taken care of, um, at least with basic needs? And if so, how do we resource that? How do we come up with that? You guys have talked all the time about your personal concerns about money, and yet you're so much farther ahead than many in the world. Can you imagine yourself sharing what you've got, cutting it you know, in five or six pieces and giving the majority away in order to have safety and basic meals and shelter for others? That's a, that's a big ask. That's why I, that's why I said it was more of like I I wish that could happen. It's a humanitarian issue, but it's it's not a there's no like real world fix to it. You can't provide for everybody. That's just not how life works. But if it were possible, then I would say we would do it. But that's why I brought up the second point of why don't we just blow it up? Oops. So we are all. Um, Immigrant. We, we, we all fled somewhere at some point for some reason, unless you have someone in your class that is 100% Native American. So uh, beyond, beyond tribal natives here, every single one of us have some type of story where our families or members of our families decided at some point that getting on a ship was safer or better than staying on dry land. And that going to the unknown where they had nothing was the only logical choice. So in our family histories, we've all been in this situation. And no one would leave what's comfortable, what they know, what feels like home in their tradition, unless they had a really good reason. So there is that to remember that maybe we've climbed out of it because it's been a few generations, but every single one of us are are migrants from somewhere? Uh, can I say something quick? Yes, of course. I feel like Anthony's right. We should just go ahead and like drop the bomb because with uh, Pearl Harbor, the Japanese all they did was just wipe out all of our boats and uh, American soldiers. But with the terrorists, they knocked out. Uh, a historic landmark, which was the Twin Towers, and then it was a civilian. I that was just but I feel like if we could drop a nuke on 
Hiroshima and the other place I forgot where it was, why Nagasaki. can't Nagasaki. Nagasaki. Nagasaki? How come we can't drop a smaller nuke or just a bunker buster to kill the main uh, leader right now? So the political conversation in Washington, D.C. is this. They believe that President Trump had the right to do what he did. Um, however, he probably doesn't have the right to do anything bigger or next without cr cr congressional approval. And can you imagine getting all of those people to agree? Because basically you have to declare war. This was not a war. But he can't, President Trump himself can't say by himself, I'm going to go bomb them and take them out. Um, you know, when you think about bin Laden, that went on for ever and ever and ever because uh, we have a system of checks and balances and one person can't, you know, push the red button, in quotes. One person can't make a decision that big that impacts yeah. our country. So it's going to take time and when you have time, then you're letting the other side know something's going to happen. So, yes. What? <laughs> oh, uh, I mean, like, do you think that that's an eventual coming to? I mean, we have General Mattis right now, who's obviously very fond of technical warfare, like not blowing up large areas, but critical points, mm -hmm. a more smart approach to it, basically, like, instead of just totaling the place. We told all the places inside that place that are running everything. So I think that that would be like a strategic point of view that the administration right now might have, but I don't know if I'm like right about that. Which of Bunker Buster will do? Yeah. Right. Well, and so your point is, do you do little things and then all you do is just continue the bleed or do you do one thing and, you know, do the amputation and move on? I think yeah. um, with President Trump, he uh, would be more inclined than any other president recently to make a big play or a big move or a big statement. So if there is a president that would go and take out leadership, I would say it, w it would be more him than Hillary had she been elected. Thank God she did. I feel like we should just do the same thing they do, just get us at our critical points, but not with, you know, suicide vests and whatnot, but I mean with airfield and the Air Force. I feel like if we just hit them critically, then if we hit the bottom of the structure, then we're going to reach the top and we're just going to annihilate them completely without killing civilians. That's the most important part is just don't, we don't need a civilian casualty. Like, the problem with me with Hiroshima and Nagasaki is we had an, an extreme amount of civilian casualties. They had no point in this. Their government was the one that was fighting. The, they didn't choose this for themselves, and we had killed all of them. It didn't matter. That's why I say one strategy of um, governments to prevent big acts is to make sure that there's human casualty. So in Operation Protection Shield, my, my daughter was in Israel a few years ago when they had the war and all the rockets were being launched. Israel warned over and over, we're gonna hit this critical target, and it was all military base. And the Palestinians put uh, you know, <laughs> citizens on top of those buildings to make sure that they could say that there was human casualty, but they caused it, they knew about it, and they caused it for media purposes. So that's the big play. Is Trump willing to say a little bit of human casualty is um, better for the greater good of saving more innocent civilians or not? And that's a very difficult question and it's one that our government usually stops short of. We usually stop short of um, civilian casualty. So we have about a minute, and we do meet uh, on the 21st, so in two Fridays. I'll give you an update on your bill, but it would be interesting to see, um, A, where we go with this, and B, what your thoughts are, and if you're afraid that anything that we do in the Middle East might actually hit the soil of the United States, if there might be ramifications there. So that's always something to consider. Yeah, so I'm thinking, Jenna, they all have a little piece of paper in front of them. If you guys want to write on uh, what topic you want to talk about next time, 
we do the capital classroom and then I'll collect those and over spring break talk about them and, and uh, email then we'll come up with a plan for the last the last that sound good does everybody have a little so much, you guys what what do you guys want to talk about next time if they're gonna blow me up thanks Jenna I appreciate it